that box geometric computing with Python course from theory to practice. Um, if you want to see the course notes and all the material for this course, please uh, check it at the URL in uh, this slide or in the comments uh, below. So this is a course presented uh, by Sebastian, which works at TU Berlin, and uh, Tzio, Chen Cheng, and me, and Daniele, from uh, New York University. The goal of the course is to teach you how to design, program, and analyze algorithms for doing geometric computing. And in particular, we will give you hands-on experience with shape modeling and the geometry processing algorithm by, during the entire course, showing you live demos. And um, you will see in a second that you can also access the same material and run it on uh, your machine as you um, follow the videos in this course. And the, a focus of the course will be on learn how to do batch processing of large collection of geometric data to use it for uh, deep learning pipelines. Um, first of all, what is geometric computing? It's a field that is in between discrete differential geometry that focuses on representing surfaces and volumes and uh, defining the operators that uh, work on them, uh, numerical methods for solving partial differential equations with a specific focus on accuracy and reliability of the solution and to work on complex uh, geometries, uh, high performance computing to uh, uh, allow us to uh, compute uh, our result in reasonable time, in particular taking advantage of vectorized computation and GPU acceleration, uh, and uh, a part of human-computer interaction because uh, the algorithm that we expose needs to be used by um, uh, people that don't have necessarily a technical background. And so it's a question of also how do you expose these interfaces to edit or work with 3D geometry to uh, users. Um, geometric computing is somewhere in between uh, all these fields, and especially now uh, it's, it has to deal with large uh, collection of uh, data, which is something uh, new, but at least in our community uh, has only been started to be studied recently. Um, geometric computing involves the entire life of a shape uh, or the entire uh, process that a shape goes through, starting from the real world, uh, when you have a physical object and then you acquire it to get, for example, a set of range images that are 2D images where for every pixel, instead of having a color, you have a, a depth. These um, range images are then converted, consolidated in an unstructured model. Uh, in this case, it's a triangle mesh, which is going to be the main focus of this course. And then depending on the application, this mesh is converted into a structured one. Uh, then meshes are used in large uh, list of applications some, uh, some, such as computer animation, physical simulation, fabrication, visual effects, or structural analysis. And in particular, there is um, uh, a specific interest in geometric computing for fabrication, where the goal is to optimize geometries that are then going back to the real world thanks to 3D printing to, to produce a variant of the original object. So the tools that you're going to study in this course are going to be useful for all these different steps and they're going to be building blocks for creating algorithms for all these different steps of this. So uh, let's uh, get started. The uh, first thing is to install all the libraries that you will need for uh, this course. So the libraries that you're going to use are implemented in C++ for efficiency reasons, but they're all exposed to Python to make the integration uh, into uh, other um, softwares easier. ...through Conda. So you can install it with uh, these uh, four lines. Um, if you don't want to install it on your local machine, what you can do instead is uh, use Binder. So I'm going to show an example here. So if you go to the uh, website of uh, the course and you go to course material, you're going to find uh, the uh, notebooks. And in particular, there is this Binder icon here that allows you to launch the corresponding uh, notebook on another tab of, of your browser. And um, when you go here, you need to wait um, a little bit to get uh, the um, uh, repository running. And uh, after it runs, you can directly execute in here live the uh, commands uh, that, um, that are going to be used in the slides used by uh, all the instructor of this course. Let's go back to our slides. Um, what libraries are we going to cover here and uh, what do they do? 
So one comment before we delve into it is that you should be able to run this course on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And if something doesn't work, please do let us know uh, either via email or opening issues on, on GitHub. So the first library is Meshplot. This is a um, library integrated with Jupyter Notebooks that allows you to visualize 3D data. And uh, you will see during this uh, course that it can visualize many different things like surfaces, signal on surfaces, um, vector fields, and uh, annotations. And all of these is easily callable from Python, mostly requiring just a few lines of code. Um, another one is libigl. This is a library uh, that has been developed for uh, many years. It contains a large collection of um, geometry processing algorithms, and we're going to use extensively this library for doing uh, both loading of meshes and processing, and there is going to be an entire section uh, dedicated to uh, libigl. Then uh, wild meshing. Uh, this is an uh, open source uh, library for doing uh, meshing, so for both uh, triangle meshing in 2D and tetrahedral meshing in 3D. Um, it's um, also uh, this one fully available through, um, through Conda, and you're going to see in one of the applications how to use this library to generate your meshes. Finally, uh, Polyfem. Uh, this is a library for doing finite element for, for, for doing simulations using the finite element method. And also this one is uh, uh, available through Python and it will be used in, in one of the applications. We can actually read in some geometry and we do this with the libigl function. Um, read triangle mesh. So this is a function that loads arbitrary triangle uh, mesh uh, formats. And if we're running this, we see that we actually get back two arrays, and these are exactly the arrays, the vertex array, as well as the face array. So let's uh, pick some names for those, and let's call them B and F again. And um, we're good to do some calculation on these arrays. So let's first maybe look at the shapes. So we see that we actually have 3,485 vertices and we have 6,000 or roughly 7,000 faces in our uh, bunny object. So next uh, check, we want to check that this is actually uh, a bunny that we loaded here. So let's just call the meshplot plot function and hand in the vertices as well as the faces. And we see this viewer opens again and we can look at our geometry. Now if you want to write out geometry, let's say we have modified it or you want to save it in a different file format, we can actually do this with the libigl as well. So we just call igl.write triangle mesh and now we can say let's store this as bunny new.obj And now I've forgotten to for sure hand in the geometry. So the next parameters are then the vertices as well as the faces. We could also pick a different format here. So we could also save as an off file. And the return parameter down here tells us that the file was actually saved. So let's go on. We learned about how to visualize surfaces, but what about point clouds? If we visualize surfaces, we can directly move um, to visualize point clouds by just removing the, the faces. And now you have a visualization of this point cloud. What if we want to also add colors, for example? So let's add the faces again. And now some color map. So for the colors, we could, for example, pick the first coordinate of our vertex array. So let's just pick the x coordinate. And now we see that the bunny um, is actually visualized with a function on top of it and the function is mapped into a color with the default numpy matplotlib color map. Um, we can do the same for sure also for point clouds. So we can also visualize the points with colors for 
all different types of visualizations and debugging. Okay, so we just learned about advanced visualization techniques. So in many applications we want to visualize scalar and vector fields. Uh, let's say for example we want to visualize the surface normals of some geometry and for this libigl also brings a function so we can just call the per face normals function of libigl and then hand in the vertex and face array again and here's some zeros for um, undefined normals and then we get back the face normals so one normal per face of our geometry and um, to visualize these face normals we can for example pick color coding so we hand in the colors again and we just use the absolute value of these face normals let's see how this works out so this is the plot and we see that the normal direction of our face normals is directly mapped into uh, red green and blue color values so the colors show us into which the triangles point. Uh, for this we also set some shading parameters in order to avoid um, misleading reflections. So what if we want to visualize some vector fields? We can also use the normals example here. Uh, but in this case we use vertex normal so we calculate one normal per vertex of our geometry and libigl also has this function available here and now we visualize the vertex normals uh, also color coded um, in this visualization let's do this first um, so here we have a point visualization and um, the colors of the points are a representative of the normals in these vertices or points and we can also add a vector visualization by just calling uh, add lines function on our plot object and we hand in the starting positions which are just our points and the ending positions of the vectors or lines we want to plot are just the points plus a little bit of um, into the direction of our vertex normals. Let's see how this looks. So if we visualize this again, we see that we not only have the points visualized now, but also the normal directions as vectors or lines. For our cut data that we're using, we use the ABC dataset. This dataset is a dataset of 1 million cut models or computer-aided design models and it brings with it a lot of features that we can use for machine learning. We will learn about this in a few minutes. So you can acquire the ABC or download the ABC dataset from deepgeometry.github.io and then ABC dataset or just search for ABC dataset and you will find it. Let's see. So for reading the data we need a few libraries again. For example we need the uh, YAML library and then libigl for processing, numpy for data representation and meshplot for visualizing the data. So let's see if we have downloaded the ABC dataset. Uh, there are different channels. In this case we just make use of the OBJ or object channel as well as the feature channel. And if we want if we want to load our data for training a machine learning model, uh, we now now need to load the the models. And we can do this by defining such a simple read model function, uh, where we make use of read obj from libigl, and then we read out uh, all the vertices, the normals, the face indices, and normal indices that that we get from this libigl function as well as um, the features we get from this the features file and we load these with yaml so once they are loaded we just put everything into a dictionary and we return it uh, let's call this read model function on one of the models from abc and now we see we get for example 20,000 vertices in this model 40,000 faces roughly and our feature um, dictionary contains two keys. One are the curves and the other feature, feature descript 
section are the surfaces. So there are two lists basically in there that um, describe features on curves and features on surfaces. We'll see about this uh, in a minute again. So the first feature of the ABC data set that I want to present are surface normals. We will also use this as one features for training a machine learning model later. Uh, let's first execute the code and then go through it by line, line by line. So these are the surface normals for the model that I just loaded uh, here in color coding. So uh, this is the model with 20,000 vert vertices and 40,000 faces roughly. Uh, what we are doing here first is averaging the normals since the ABC dataset brings um, normals for all the vertices but on, on these sh uh, sharp edges here for example there are actually two normals defined for each of the vertices. So what we're doing here in this averaging step is just um, averaging the possibly n normals of, of all the vertices and creating one normal uh, for those. Let's quickly see. Um, see the directions with uh, vector visualization. So we see that on these edges the normals and the average normals are actually uh, pointing diagonal away from the the edges. This is one way of defining it. There, there could be other ways of defining it. Okay, and this uh, is one of the features that we're gonna uh, train a machine learning model later on. So what we input into the model are then point clouds and we get out um, surface normals for each of the points in our point clouds. Um, so this is the last tutorial and I will be using all the library uh, I sh we show you during this uh, course. So we call it a uh, final example, ultimate example. So I will be using uh, NumPy for the algebra, some math, uh, for doing some basic operation, then LibIGL or IGL for, the, for loading data and manipulating geometrical data, while meshing for uh, meshing and polyfem for the final time. So uh, I show you before an example in 2D, and since this is the ultimate example, I will be showing you uh, an example in 3D. So let me just import this library by just executing this cell. Focus. Okay, so now I executed the cell. So the first thing we want to do is to just get a, a mesh uh, from the D. So this will be the domain we'll be solving the PDE. So, uh, in this case, we want to have an ultimate example. So I, would, I selected a mesh from the ABC data set, which is full of CAD models or mechanical piece. And this is how our mesh looks like. So now the first step in finite elements is always try to get that mesh out of it. And in this case, it will be a tetrahedral mesh. So what we want to do is to create a tetrahedral mesh. And this is something a little bit more complicated than a triangular mesh. So for this, we want to use a uh, wild meshing and we want to use uh, the tetrahedralizer. So there are two ways of using the tetrahedralizer. One, we can just tetrahedralize uh, an input file, or we can use this more advanced object-oriented way, which just creates a tetrahedralizer, and then uh, set a mesh, and then call the tetrahedralize uh, function. And the big difference between uh, the two is that once we call the tetrahedralize function, we just get the mesh of the whole uh, volume, uh, including also the bounding box around, and then we can have use different strategy to extract the tet mesh out of it. So, for example, we can just call get that mesh, which uses the uh, winding number, or we can use the float field strategy if you prefer. But uh, the post processing, so extracting the tet mesh out of it, is something extremely cheap. And this is why it's completely separated. So now we are waiting a little bit uh, to uh, generate the tetrahedral mesh. And then uh, this will be the tetrahedral mesh of the whole volume. And then what we can do uh, is just extract the tet mesh with uh, one command. And if we are unhappy with the extraction, we can try and experiment with different one without uh, need of waiting the whole tetrahedralization to happen. So another uh, thing here is that uh, for timing reason, I'm just stopping the quality of the TED mesh to be maximum uh, 30. So normally the default is 10, so here we are allowing for an element with a little bit uh, worse uh, shape. So I think it's uh, almost finished. Uh, it also looks lower because I'm running uh, on Chrome in full screen uh, mode. It's usually a little bit faster. Okay, so it's uh, almost finished. Uh, 
Okay, now we get uh, the tetrahedral mesh of the whole volume. So now let's just extract the tet mesh, and here we can just use the default winding number since uh, the mesh was nice, and we can try to plot. So here we are getting B, uh, TB and TT, which are the tetrahedral vertices and the tetrahedral uh, faces TT. So this is the mesh we get out of it. And you see here a nice uh, side effect of feature of uh, that one, which is automatically coarsening and generate a mesh, which is nice, even if the input was uh, so full of faces like, like here. So we get a tetrahedral mesh, which is much coarser. We can control also the resolution. So now the next step is, well, we want to specify the boundary condition. And here we want to do something fancy. We want to, for example, attach this part here, and we want to move this other part here. So we cannot rely anymore on automatically uh, selecting faces next to the bounding box. What we want to use is to use a function, a lambda function, to uh, select them. So before that, we just can just load the mesh uh, into uh, Polyfem, and we get uh, this mesh with the bounding box, so everything is good. So for the, uh, for the side set, here what we want to do is just get the bounding box of the mesh using SciPy. We're getting B and uh, F, so this is the input mesh. And now what we have here is just a function that takes a point, so face by the center, and it returns a number, a number depending on which side set it is. So here I'm just creating a function which first selects if uh, the body center in Z here, coordinate 2, is close to the Z of the minimum of the bounding box. And then if the Y is larger than the center, it means it's the top part of this um, flat region, it's 2, and otherwise it's 1. Let me just uh, execute this cell. So now we can just set the, uh, the side set using the function we just defined, and then as in the 2D example, just get the, uh, the side set out of it to verify if everything is correct. So here we don't see anything, but uh, what I did is just creating an array of color which is 0, and then set uh, the value to 2 where it's 2, and 3 to where it's 3. And you see here, everything here is violet, so 0, and then we have 1 and 2, so green and yellow, appearing here for the uh, faces we select. So this is, again, a, a sanity check. When you set your uh, side set, it's always important to actually plot them and be sure that you actually selected what you want. Uh, in, in normal software, normal finite element software, you do that through clicking on faces. And another important thing is to check if, you are, if your selection didn't leak on some faces you don't want. And in this case, everything is nice and kosher. So now that we have the side set, while well, it's exactly as before, we just created a problem, we can set the PDE here, select some material parameter, here I want some rubber to deform it better, and then we can just set some force uh, on 2, which is, sorry, set some displacement 0 on 2, which is the bottom part, and apply some force on the top part. And this is exactly as what we had before, it has different indices, but it's exactly the same way of solving it. And now, as before, where we can just uh, solve it, I put some more, uh, I mute the login because it, uh, it will be too verbose, and now we get the solution, so it takes a little bit of time, and now we can just visualize the solution, and this is again the same pl plot we had before. So I'm just getting the uh, points, the tetrahedra, and the displacement, and now we're not visualizing anymore the Fermi's stress, I'm visualizing the norm of the displacement, and at the very end I'm just displacing the vertices and uh, visualizing the uh, uh, mesh like that. And now you see everything here is nice and we get this uh, nice default solution. So now what about if we want to do some fancy visualization? Let's say for example uh, visualizing the uh, isolines of this uh, displacement field. So I told you that in Polyfam the solution is actually upsampled because uh, you may use a higher order element or because your geometric mapping may be not linear. And because of that, every element in this tetrahedral mesh is completely separated and disconnected to the next one. So every tetrahedron is on its own. So if you want to visualize isoline, well, there are several steps we need to take. The first one is we need to merge all these tetrahedral together. Then we need to extract the surface, and then we can actually uh, extract the isoline. So the first thing is to uh, remove the duplicate vertices to stitch everything together. We can just use NumPy. We can just use NumPy unique, and this returns us the unique points. So we use P, so P was the solution here, the sample solution. Give us 
the new points, the unique points, but also the mapping, the indices and the inverse mapping. So we can use that, for example, to uh, select uh, the faces or select the displacement or the coloring. So like that, we obtain uh, a mesh, which is now all stitched together with just three lines of NumPy. And this is, again, one of the power of using NumPy as a glue is that now you have the full power of different libraries like NumPy or even PyTorch or TensorFlow. So now we want to uh, extract a tetrahedral mesh. So we can just use IGL to get the tet tet adjacency. So this is a function that returns us an adjacency list. So it tells us for every tetrahedron uh, which other tetrahedron it's adjacent to. And there is a convention is that if adjacent to that tetrahedral is minus one, it means there is no one. So here what we'll be doing is just going over the adjacency list, going over all the faces of the tetrahedron, get the face, check if the adjacency list of uh, that face is minus one, it means it's a boundary, there is no one on that size, and we just append uh, that uh, face to the list, to the surface face. And in the very end here, we're just converting that list into an umpire. We execute that cell. So this is just a loop to extract the surface uh, of a tetrahedral mesh. So now we get the surf the faces of the two tetrahedral mesh. So the final thing we just need to do is just get the isolines, and for doing that, we just call IGL isolines. And on what? Well, on some on some points, the surface mesh and uh, the color we want. And in this case, we want to have 20 isolines. And this will return us a list of uh, points and lines uh, in 3D. So let me just call that. So now we have the points and the isolines. So now we can finalize the visualization. So here I'm just visualizing the surface mass for efficiency reasons since we have it. And then I'm just uh, adding edges and well, the edges will be ISO P. So this is the points we just calculated and ISO L. So this is the final visualization. And we see here nicely uh, the ISO line of uh, the displacement field. So again, you see with uh, some few lines uh, uh, of Python, we can go from uh, loading a mesh into generating a tetrahedral mesh, run a finite element simulation, and then manipulate it with NumPy and LibIGL to get, for example, isoline. It's the uh, end of the course, and I just have a few concluding remarks. So in uh, the future, we, are, uh, we plan to continue to work on this infrastructure that was originally developed to support uh, our own research. Uh, everything that you saw today uh, is the, um, a way of working that we use in, uh, in our groups to uh, be faster in prototyping uh, geometric computing algorithms and to make them available to a wider audience. Uh, some things that we plan to do in the future is, first of all, continuing to keep wild meshing and LibIGL up to date with the C++ version, uh, so that every new feature added to C++ will also be available in Python, and uh, we're going to do our best to add it uh, to this uh, course too. Uh, Polyfem is still in its early development, and new features are being exposed uh, in Python as soon as they're added to the C++ version, and things that we want to add in the uh, near future as support for um, time-dependent fluid simulation and uh, support for collision detection and uh, response. Uh, one thing that we want to do for Meshplot is to add it an option to export um, the current scene so that it can be rendered, can be rendered offline using, for example, a physic ba physically based rendering module uh, that will allow to directly produce images that are uh, useful for usable for for papers. Um, it would be very useful if uh, you let us know what do you think about this course and what do you think about uh, the libraries. In particular, if you use any of this material in your papers, please make sure to cite uh, the course and the corresponding libraries and the papers they are based on. Uh, if you um, want to contribute, we are very happy to receive uh, pull requests uh, or feedback and all of these uh, should go through GitHub. So the recommended way of reaching out to us for questions, suggestions, uh, or complaints is uh, to open issues on the corresponding GitHub repo or to leave uh, comments on uh, these uh, videos. Um, so this uh, concludes the course. Thanks you. Thank you very much for your attention and stay tuned for more updates.